Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Columbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. And we're very glad you're with us for the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. It's officially the kickoff of impeachment season, at least the public version of it. So, uh, Jim... We're not really sure what to make of the hearing so far, other than that uh, a lot of people know how to talk for really long periods of time. It's also fun to watch Twitter and the seemingly endless uh, testimony of uh, Bill Taylor and two people ostensibly on the right that I see. One says, this is devastating testimony, and the other says, all this really means is that he wishes he was running the Ukraine and U.S. foreign policy instead of the actual president who's tasked with doing so. Uh, a lot of minds are being changed here, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I'm hoping the visual aids for later this afternoon, Greg, include Rorschach tests. <laughs> so that way everyone can say, oh, I see evidence that he's clearly got to be removed from office immediately. And other people say, I see a puppy. <laughs> Well, we're going to have quite a few of these hearings over the next uh, couple of weeks. I believe it was earlier today, Jim, uh, you were commenting on this on Twitter that uh, somebody over on the Republican side of the Senate thought that uh, the trial, assuming it gets there, which it probably will, will take six to eight weeks and run about six hours a day. So uh, uh, all those people worried about uh, certain senators not being on the campaign trail for up to two months, uh, that could actually happen. So have fun, everyone. I was going to say, you could also, first of all, you could hear Mitch McConnell quietly giggling in the background. And I understand Pete Buttigieg uh, may need medical treatment from laughing so hard as soon as that was announced. Yeah, the only thing that's Somebody likes it. <laughs> the only thing better than being in first place in Iowa is having nobody else there hardly, except for Joe Biden. Uh, well, if there's anything we know, we know Iowa caucus goers, they're perfectly cool with you not showing up. <laughs> By no means do they expect to personally meet you several times and evaluate their decision on that. There's no way they'd feel snubbed about Senator Snubb. Oh, this could get very interesting. Well, speaking of impeachment, let's get to our martinis. We got crazy, bad, and bad, I think, is how we're going to classify these today. Jim, you wrote about this a little bit uh, for National Review in response to uh, an idea from Juliana Glover over at Politico, she has worked for many Republicans in the past, including George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, John Ashcroft, Rudy Giuliani, Jeb Bush, and John McCain. But she's really, really trying to find a way to get President Trump removed from office. And her idea is, hey, what if when we get to a guilty or not guilty vote in the Senate, we actually have a secret ballot instead of each senator being called out and having to say guilty or not guilty? Those of you old enough to remember the Clinton impeachment probably remember that. I certainly do. And uh, uh, Jim, she goes off on this long uh, explanation about how this could possibly work. And it's a really good idea because people like Mike Murphy, the campaign consultant and former Senator Jeff Flake, think there's 30 to 35 Republican senators who would vote to convict Trump if they knew it wasn't on the record. And then there's this beautiful addendum later on at the end of her story now that says, some constitutional scholars have pointed out that Article 1, Section 5 of the Constitution designates that 20 senators can oppose a secret ballot on any questions. But questions are defined as any matter on which the Senate is to vote, such as passage of a bill, adoption of an amendment, agreement to a motion, or an appeal. No mention of impeachment proceedings is made. I'm pretty sure that uh, clause covered just about everything there, Jim. So uh, what do you make of... Uh, our, our august media just scratching with their fingernails to try to find any way to get rid of this president. Yeah, we're, we're kind of in the fan fiction uh, <laughs> stage of the impeachment process in which people really just want to think about, is there some way we can get to the 67 votes? And they're willing to, you know, uh, imagine scenarios that are not just very unlikely. Are, are there a whole bunch of Republicans who are in the Senate who probably privately can't stand Trump? Yes. Is it it is not hard to meet, you know, these guys are, are not, don't hide it a great deal when they're off the record. This is a maddening president in a lot of ways. Would they be, you know, happier and more comfortable in a world with President Mike Pence? Sure. But there's no way to do this secret. Because one, any Republican senator who says, yes, let's do this by secret ballot, will automatically be perceived as saying, OK, I'm going <laughs> to vote to impeach, but I don't want anybody to know about it. Look, I have uh, a whole bunch of beefs with the president. I'm also not really on board with this idea of impeachment turning into just another tool for, for registering opposition to a president. I'd like to think that wherever you come down on this issue, whatever you think of Trump, you should feel like, well, if the, if the Senate's going to impeach a president, remove him from office, 
they should have the courage to say, yes, I believe this president should be removed from office and I'm voting so right here out in public for everybody to know, vote for me, vote against me, but this is where I stand. This idea that, well, I have a strong view on whether this president should continue to be in office, but I'm not going to tell anyone. Don't run for Senate then. This is part of the job. This comes with the territory. It's not like this snuck up on you or something like that. Um, you mentioned, by the way, that, that close vote they had back in 1998 uh, there, Greg. It was worth noting. It was about 50-50, but it depends on how you want to classify Arlen Specter, who voted not proven, <laughs> uh, citing Scottish law. Scottish that law. Up, and I... I I believe because you know, I was I believe, actually it was Angus McSpector um, was the senator who voted not proven <laughs> to which Henry Hyde, one of the uh, House Judiciary Committee members who uh, was pushing for impeachment, responded, not Scottish. By the way, it, it was proven that yeah, Clinton had lied, had lied under oath and encouraged other people to lie. There wasn't really in doubt anywhere. So this is where we are. I, I wrote in the corner, I said, this is a terrible idea. This is a really, really bad idea. Look, one is that impeachment, we've never done this before in our history. Nixon resigned. The other two efforts to impeach the president failed in the Senate, right? We should treat this like a really big deal. Now, if you want to argue that more presidents should operate under the threat of impeachment, that you get better behavior from presidents if they're worried about this, I'm open to that argument. But back in 1998, this country decided that, you know, lying under oath and telling somebody else to lie under oath is not important enough to remove a president. So that puts that bar really, really high in my mind. Now, what Trump has done, I think most Republicans would say that's pretty bad. Um, does it warrant impeachment? Whatever your view is, you should be able to say, I say yes, he should be impeached or no, he shouldn't be impeached. And you shouldn't hide about this. And if you're only willing to do something in a secret ballot and you're not willing to defend it to your constituents, you probably shouldn't be voting that way. I have this idea that any idea worth defending is worth defending. And if the argument is, if you're, you know, this is so important, look, if you really see Trump as this, this unconstitutional menace who, who is um, trample, abusing his power and trampling over our laws and balance of powers and all that kind of stuff, isn't this the sort of thing you should be willing to lose your seat over? Is this the sort of thing where you go, this is an absolute mess, but look, I'm, I'm not going to risk my seat over it. I begin to understand why people are so infuriated with congressional Republicans. Yeah, not exactly profiles encourage a lot of the time. But, uh, Jim, you, you, you bring up an important point, not just in the halls of Congress, but in perhaps some of the impeachment numbers that we're hearing. I mean, we've we've seen survey after survey from civic literacy groups about how civically illiterate our population is becoming in a certain Chunks of our population don't even know how many branches of government there are. So when it comes to whether the president should be removed from office, uh, it, it's hard to quantify. But you got to think when it's uh, somewhere in the 40s or in some cases around 50 percent, It how much of that is people who just don't like him and want him gone? And how many people think he's actually violated uh, his his office to the point where he is guilty of high crimes and misdemeanors and therefore ought to be removed from office? Yeah, it, it's one of those things where this should not affect how you see what the president did and whether you see it at representing an abuse of power. But the fact remains that Democrats began uh, petitions arguing in favor of impeachment on January 20th, 2017, literally the day Trump was sworn, was sworn into office. Uh, lawmakers like uh, Maxine Waters and folks that were saying, get ready for impeachment in like March 2017. Polling indicated that Democrat majorities of Democrats supported impeachment in the spring of 2017. It is safe to say this is an opposition that never really accepted Trump's presidency, which I think makes it less, you know, if, if they had said, look, we gave this guy a shot, we tried to work with him, what he's done here violates, is an abuse of power, Congress appropriated these funds to be sent to Ukraine, he did not have the authority to hold them up, uh, and he certainly didn't have the authority to do it up, to hold them up in secret. Look, I, you know, on those merits, it's a very strong argument, but it comes in the context of this all-out partisan warfare that's been going since the moment he got in. And for obvious reasons, Republicans, a lot of Republicans are like, hey, you know what? You want to beat this guy, you beat this guy at the ballot box. You don't get a chance to do this through uh, this impeachment process. And the end result is we have a, you know, we get a long, long stretch of kabuki theater before this all ends up with the acquittal that we all know is coming. All right, let's move on to our first bad martini here, Jim. And uh, it's should be the, the big news of the day. Uh, and if it weren't for the impeachment hearings, they would be getting a lot more attention. It's probably fortunate for the president that it's not. Uh, the Turkish president's in town. You know, he's coming to the White House because they're buddies. And they reached this landmark deal a few weeks back to 
and the fighting against the Kurds because they're just going to give the Turks the territory. And uh, we've talked about that issue at nauseum. But here's the, the AP story here. Uh, Trump and Erdogan will meet as relations between the two NATO allies are at their lowest point in decades with Turkey rebuffing the U.S. and turning toward Russia on security issues. And Ankara facing a Washington backlash over attacks on Kurdish civilians during its incursion into Syria last month. Uh, Mike McCall, the uh, top Republican on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, says there's still outstanding questions about whether there are war crimes involved in what just happened uh, with the Turks uh, attacking the Kurds. So uh, what do you make of uh, Trump extending the offer at all? And uh, how tough do you really expect him to be today? Well, Greg, first of all, I want to observe, I think it's just swell that we're really reevaluating our relationship with Turkey. And in fact, it has really become near the top of the U.S. foreign policy agenda. 11 years after I was over there and had all this expertise and really followed this <laughs> issue in, in great depth and all that stuff. Great timing on that. Um, you, you could argue that this kind of reevaluation of our relationship with Turkey and maybe even the argument of whether Turkey should, still belongs in NATO, uh, that we could have we could have and should have had that going back two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. Right? Um, when I was over there, 20, 2005, 2007, Erdogan had just come into power uh, and he was seen as a guy who was not our first choice, but we could still do business with him. Bit by bit, step by step, he became more and more of an autocrat. He was always an Islamist, but there was always, he always was a little more um, uh, nuanced, shall we say, or, or a little more careful about how he pushed his agenda or something like that. Uh, and now the, it's very clear Erdogan is a um, arguably a menace to our interests. Uh, he's cozying up to Russia. He's cozying up to China. He has no interest in a closer relationship with uh, uh, Europe and, and traditional Western values. Um, as we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, he's, he's autocratic. They're, they're, you, it's very hard. To, Turkey um, uh, jails more journalists than any other country on earth. And look, you think about some of those countries, China, Saudi Arabia, there's a lot of tough competition in that category. And I think you look at the way he attacked the Kurds, and oh, by the way, he, Turkey was not always the most easy ally in our fight against ISIS. Um, Erdogan is now a pretty vehemently and consistently anti-American guy. He's against our interests. And for some reason, Trump is absolutely convinced he can sweet talk this guy. Not all that different from the way he thinks he can sweet talk Kim Jong-un to get it, you know, cooperating. Um, by the way, I suppose the highlight of this visit, Greg, will be whether anybody gets their, their uh, skull kicked in by any of his security guards this time. Right. And they remember that infamous footage. This would be a really good time to see the administration take a tougher line with, with uh, Turkey. In Turkey, Trump has found the one nominal ally he's not willing to get tough with, that he's not willing to berate, that he's not willing to play tough with. And all of a sudden, they're rolling out the red, you know, the red carpet. Look, Turkish military forces were deliberately bracketing our guys in the Kurdish territories less than a month ago, and we're rolling out the red carpet for this guy. It is an absolutely appalling lapse in judgment by this administration. Deeply frustrating uh, that we are so friendly to these foreign leaders who are hostile to our interests, while at the same time being snotty to our traditional allies in, in Europe and elsewhere. Complete unforced error. And this is the president's instincts, because clearly a good chunk of his national security team does not agree with this kind of block approach. And it kind of shows the national ADD we have that it feels like that was ages ago where we were focused on Turkey and what they were doing against the Kurds to create their supposed uh, buffer zone over there. It was probably, what, a few weeks ago, tops. Um, but just as we uh, hit the media in the first martini, we're going to hit him a little again here because uh, here's the AP in the next paragraph. Uh, the scheduled afternoon news conference with Trump and Erdogan, however, will give Trump a stage two. And you're thinking, oh, Confront Turkey, uh, put Erdogan on the spot, explain that we're going to stand by the Kurds, uh, explain that if we see any more malfeasance, uh, the sanctions are going to slam back down. No. However, we'll give Trump a stage to counter the first public hearings in the House impeachment inquiry, which means, Jim, that our media is not even going to pay attention to this U.S.-Turkey issue at all today in the press conference. They're just going to pepper him with impeachment questions, aren't they? Yeah, and, but let's keep in mind also that Trump is going into a fight in which, as we mentioned in that first martini, it's very unlikely that you'd get large numbers of Republican senators to defect and vote to, to remove. But you'd still like, think that the White House would want to keep all those Republican senators on board. Going into, you know, abandoning the Kurds, siding with Erdogan, giving the green light to the Turks, all, all, all of that did, you know, really angered Senate Republicans on Capitol Hill in a way that few other moves by this administration had. It's like there's an exposed nerve and Trump just can't resist the urge to poke at it, 
even amongst people who are his allies and who are supposed to be on his side. And again, it'd be really not, you know, apparently he's trying to uh, bring, he's invited a bunch of Republican senators to meet with Erdogan. Keep in mind the the oddity of the U.S. president basically acting as sort of shuttle diplomacy between a foreign leader and, you know, senators of his own party. And again, like, why are the arguments from Republican senators so extraordinarily unpersuasive to this president? And why are the arguments from friggin' Erdogan persuasive to this president? It's deeply frustrating by the president's judgment we see here. All right, Jim, let's move to our final martini here. I think this is bad. It's also got a tinge of crazy to it. But uh, we hear from uh, both parties every uh, presidential election cycle, well, you know, I think this time around this state might be in play for us. We heard that about uh, states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania forever until it actually happened for President Trump uh, in 2016. Uh, Democrats have been talking about various states for a long time. Virginia seems to be now in their column, whereas 15 years ago it was pretty solidly Republican, at least in federal elections. Now, of course, they keep talking about turning Texas blue, and things were a little bit tighter there thanks to Beto uh, in 2018. They think they can possibly do that again this time around. Uh, Arizona is another one, and so is Georgia. And now there's actually some numeric evidence in Georgia that the, the president could have a very difficult time winning re-election in that state because according to a new poll from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, about 54% of registered voters disapprove of Trump, while 44% approve. And then in the head-to-heads, he's losing to Joe Biden, 51-43. to 43. And while they're much tighter, he's also struggling against folks like Buttigieg, Harris, uh, Sanders, and Warren. I think we can probably take Harris out of those matchups at this point. But, Jim, uh, not good. I mean, Georgia's a state that uh, they won by roughly five points in, in 2016. You wouldn't think it would be that massive of a shift this time around. And that's what are we talking about now? 15, 16 electoral votes. Uh, that flips. <laughs> You're in trouble again. Yeah, uh, let's put in, you know, we can put in all the appropriate caveats. This is one poll. You'd probably want to see more of these. Um, The numbers against everybody except Biden are still pretty close. But, you know, this fits a narrative here. As you mentioned, uh, his margin in Georgia was just five points. Trump won Ohio by eight points. Right. So there are certain states in which, you know, Trump did, you know, much better than typical Republican. But there are a bunch he did badly. And the ones where you see Trump doing significantly badly um, but I think you put Texas in that category where he's not winning by the traditional range that a uh, Republican usually wins in those kind of red, red to purple states is, is states with a lot of suburbs. And that's exactly where we've seen the Republican Party just get throttled, particularly here in Virginia. Um, but we saw some House seats in uh, Georgia get lost last cycle. Um, Trump is not a guy who's going to, you know, warm and fussy to those white collar voters in the suburbs, the soccer moms, the minivan drivers. I know a lot of his voters love him and say, ah, oh, you know, and he goes off on somebody on, on Twitter. He's just being authentic. Trump's style, Trump's rhetoric, everything we talked about on this podcast. Sure, it wins him some of those blue collar, white working class voters, but it also costs him some voters. And you have to accept that cost. And part of that cost is you lose the, you lose the suburbs. You lose the suburbs, you get a result like we have here in Virginia. Maybe it won't be so bad in Georgia, but maybe it will. I, I, a number like this should be a giant red flag for the uh, uh, the Republican Party. I don't think, uh, if, if I were a betting man, I would not bet that Trump's going to lose Georgia. But this is the sort of thing where you got to keep an eye on this, um, because those warning signs were already there back in the last cycle. It is conceivable, although I don't think necessarily likely, that the Democrats could nominate uh, someone who played better in Georgia than Hillary Clinton did. I think it's likely that the Democratic nominee is probably going to be more likable than Hillary in 2016. <laughs> Depends who they nominate. I mean, I mean you know, maybe Warren can be as annoying. <laughs> uh, maybe Bernie would shout. You, know, you can imagine a scenario. But, you know, if, if Biden is your placeholder there, then most people have a much warmer and fuzzier attitude towards Joe Biden than they do to Hillary Clinton. Um, again, this doesn't mean Trump's going to lose Georgia, but boy, oh boy, you know, this is, this is the sort of thing that should make you sit up and take notice and recognize that this, this bleeding in the suburbs that Republicans have going to have really big consequences unless the president, you know, can manage to pull his act together in the final year of his presidency and just suddenly stop antagonizing voters who are traditionally Republican leaning. Uh, otherwise you're going to end up seeing Republicans get demolished and particularly in a bunch of places they're not used to losing at all. Well, Jim, I think most Democrats are probably pretty encouraged by this poll, except for one. 
And her name is Stacey Abrams, because deeper on in this poll, in this survey, Governor Brian Kemp's popularity continues to rise. Some 54 percent of Georgia voters give him a favorable review one year since he won the election, up from 46 percent in April and 37 percent in January. That includes most women and about one fifth of Democrats. So, uh, Jim, the <laughs> fakely elected, that's not even a word, but the uh, improperly. I was about to say, what's that word you did before Brian Kemp's name there, Greg? <laughs> governor. Governor? Really? Okay. Fraudulent right. Governor I Brian Kemp. Is... that Abrams won. <laughs> but, uh, well, it's funny. She really should get to her office if that's the case. <laughs> I don't understand why she's running around the country talking and people say, you know, every Democrat I hear says she won the election, calls her governor and all that. So she never conceded. So uh, you know why I think Demo- I think so many Georgians, including so many women and including so many Democrats, are approving of the job Brian Kemp is doing, Greg? Why? Because he showed up to do the job. <laughs> you know, Stacey Abrams should stop running around the country if she's actually elected governor. Oh, man, that's so much fun. Most women approve of Brian Kemp. Delicious. They've got, you got to you got to find the silver lining out of out of disappointing news sometimes, and that's a that's a great finish to that last martini. Slam it down on the bar. We're done. Jim, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Really glad you were with us today on the Three Martini Lunch. Make sure you join us again tomorrow for the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. In the meantime, please subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Leave us a great review. And you can follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. See you tomorrow.